I'm going to begin. Okay. Um, my name is Carol Joins. I'm the Executive Director of the Cultural Policy Program, and I have to say it's a great pleasure to be here. For a number of reasons, we've been working on this project for a very long time. For another, it's very beautiful here, and it's not two degrees above zero and covered with um, black ice. So it's good to be here from Chicago. It's good that as many of you were able to come and participate today because the purpose of this is participation and a dialogue that will unfold over the next few hours that I think will be of interest to all of the people here. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words about the Cultural Policy Center itself um, because it's kind of a peculiar entity. Um, we, when, we, when Larry Rothfield, uh, my faculty director, and I started this, we had a lot of quizzical looks. People wanted to rename it the Culture Policy Center. They wanted to know what it was we would be up to. They were suspicious. They were excited. They were um, perplexed, I think is the best way to describe it. Mark, of course, helped us, uh, Mark Schuster helped us uh, uh, with some good answers to those questions uh, because basically, our center started at the request of a number of faculty at the University of Chicago and a couple of foundations that were interested in pushing this idea along. Um, the, the Cultural Policy Center is located at the Irving Harris School of Public Policy Studies at the University of Chicago and is one amongst a very small group. Um, I'm going to try to do this without my glasses. It's too hard to keep taking them on and off. Um, of research and teaching centers in the United States. Um, there's one in Princeton, there's one at Vanderbilt, one at USC that deals almost entirely with uh, entertainment law and um, the, the for-profit entertainment and culture sector. NYU and there are some other smaller ones. No two of them are alike. Each one has carved out a, a, a distinctive uh, piece of the territory under this large umbrella of cultural policy. All of them, however, in one manner or another, focus on what is an understudied sector, the, the cultural sector, and, and more specifically, on the role of arts and culture in public life. Um, our mission is to help inform public dialogue in exactly the kind of forum that you are participating in today. Um, it's been an interesting experience working along colleagues um, at a policy school who work on child welfare, care for the aged, uh, the environment, um, and who are economists trained in sociology, trained in all the social science disciplines, and who have gradually come to see us as participating members of the school. We were viewed, I think, some, somewhat as interlopers at the time, but the way that we have helped think about different ways of measuring, assessing, evaluating um, activities in the cultural sector has actually spawned interesting dialogue across these, these sub-disciplines at the, at the Harris School. Um, as a center, we sponsor training, research, and public events and do publications like the one that you have uh, in front of you. We prepare students in public policy for careers in the cultural sector. Um, and we, and this is the one thing I've taken especially seriously is facilitating collaborative relationships with people at the local, and that means Hyde Park sometimes, uh, in the university community, the city of Chicago, which has been a great place to undertake this kind of uh, building a center of this sort, the Chicago region, and then nationally and internationally. And we've had conferences that have brought people from all over the world. Our next big conference, for example, is going to be on, um, it was the person I'm working on it with rather tendentiously wanted to call it Farewell to Public Television, which I thought sort of loaded the, uh, loaded the conference uh, topic a little bit. But it'll be on the, the issue of the future of public television. It'll be bringing people from the BBC from, uh, from France, from uh, Australia, Canada, to, to talk with us about what our future for public television might be, um, as it's in such dire straits at the moment. So we pick events like that to try to draw in as many people um, uh, as we can who, with an interest in these various subjects. Um, I just, I'm going to close um, now. There's some other things I would like to say, but um, I want to say that it has been an enormous um, privilege and pleasure working with uh, Mark Schuster. Mark Schuster is recognized in this small field as, as really the, this, the preeminent scholar uh, 
and thinker in this area. He was there before anyone else. Uh, people have been working in this field without knowing it. That seems to be what happens. They come and they find they're working on a topic that falls under this umbrella and they're surprised to find that there's some kind of organization around it. But Mark is an exemplary scholar, has been a wonderful colleague, uh, always has enthusiasm for the project, enormous energy, and it's been, um, we, we, had a, we felt especially lucky because we were able to bring him to the University of Chicago for, as a visiting professor for a year, and our students and uh, my colleagues all benefited from that. Um, I also want to thank Stephen Smith, who's been a wonderful host here. Um, I, I, it's been a pleasure working with Stephen. Stephen's part of the research team. I'm not going to introduce all of the members of the research team. That will happen later on, and they're all listed on the title, of your, uh, title page of your book. But, um, and finally, I want to thank um, David Carricker, who is a, an old friend. Uh, he's a friend. He would say he's not old. Um, he is, uh, I've known David for almost 25 years, and David helped me uh, in the very first stages of this when Larry and I were thinking about how to put the center together, and he, he was one of the architects of the um, of, of this center in its first incarnation. And then he came to work on this team, and we're, I'm looking forward to many more years of working on projects with David as time goes on. So, um, what I'm going to do now is, oh, one thing, we need to thank the Pew Charitable Trust. The Pew Charitable Trust made this possible, and we were the last, as I can, I think, one of the last major projects in this area that they funded before their uh, cultural policy initiative um, imploded, along with the stock market and, um, and their own plans about allocation of resources. So we were very fortunate to get this grant, do this study, which we hope will be part of a series of studies of similar ones across the country. And that's what we're working on now. So we'll be interested in your reaction to this first report. I'm now going to hand it over to Mark Schuster. Thank you. As usual, Carol is much too kind. Uh, very nice to see a lot of familiar faces, folks that I got to meet when we were out in the field, and very nice also to meet those of you that I wasn't able to interview uh, when we came around. Uh, uh, this has been a, a very interesting and exciting process for us. We apologize it took so long to get to this day, uh, but uh, we did get to this day, and I think that's important. Um, I wanted to give some, some background and, and a bit of overview before we turn to the specific panels. Um, uh, just a few different uh, miscellaneous points uh, about the project and about how we think about where we are now. Um, the first thing is, uh, you will have noticed that this project was modeled in some way on a project that's been running for, for uh, 15 years at the Council of Europe. Uh, and the Council of Europe offered as a service to its member countries a program of review of national cultural policies. And the way that that worked in Europe, which is quite different from the way we operated here, but the way that worked in, in Europe is a country would say, we would like our national cultural policy reviewed. And the country then was asked to write a report saying, to the best of our ability, this is the current cultural policy in the country of France or Sweden or Italy or Austria or whichever country it happened to be. And then the Council of Europe would empower a panel of respondents or experts to go into the field, interview many of the same people, ask questions posed by the first report, and they would write a second report, which was the review of the national cultural policy. They shied away from the, from the word evaluation because it wasn't quite what a social scientist would do uh, if one were doing an evaluation of programs in the field. Um, but what has happened over those 15 or 20 years is that an amazing collection of documents now exists in Europe of two volume sets of cultural policy of the country and a response from a group of experts to the cultural policy of the country. And a, and, a, and a dialogue was promoted first at the level of the Council of Ministers in Strasbourg and then later within the individual countries for which these reports were um, compiled. Now, we knew we couldn't do something that was quite that uh, complicated in the United States. First of all, no one was saying, come and evaluate our cultural policy in the state of X. Um, and so what we decided to do was instead to try to do both sides of the project and amass the resources which would allow us to go and offer this as an opportunity to a state. And so that's where the Pew Charitable Trust came in, as, as, as Carol suggested. And the story there is actually quite interesting. In the mid-1990s, 
the cultural program at the Pew Charitable Trusts announced a very large initiative which was called Optimizing America's Cultural Policies. And I emphasize the plural, policies. And those of you who followed that will know that all hell broke loose. Right? There were a lot of articles in the newspaper. We don't know what one of those is, but we sure know that we don't need one of those. Um, that, why, is, why does Pew think that it's going to direct the cultural policy of you know, a particular state or, or indeed the nation? And of course, none of that was ever quite the intent of the program. But Pew was forced to call the program back and re-advertise the program as optimizing America's cultural resources. That was just a simple change of, of one word. And as Carol said, uh, we had been talking with Pew in that period about state cultural policy. And we were saying, look, at the state level, there's really much more going on than, than what's happening at the federal level. If you aggregate the budgets, if you aggregate the activities, it's really much more important. The problem is, is it's 50 different entities. It's not one entity. And we wanted to break the sort of cycle of scholars looking at national agencies because that's kind of you know a very popular thing to do and doctoral dissertations written about the national endowment for the arts and we said if you were able to look at the state level and if you were able to look at the state level across a set of different states with very different ways of organizing the, the cultural sector you would learn an awful lot about what works well what works less well about what where opportunities lie um, and where innovation, in fact, is happening. And you don't learn a lot of that by looking at federal agencies. So that's a, a part of the inspiration that led to us thinking about, could we take the Council of Europe model uh, and apply it to a state in the United States to get started? Now, we realized that in the United States, this was going to be a little bit different because, first of all, there was no state that had on its shelf a volume entitled The Cultural Policy of Wisconsin. Right, that we would, we would have to be developing that. And in fact, what we would have to do is we would have to infer the cultural policy from a whole variety of activities and programs and initiatives that were happening in order to make it transparent and to ask the question, how do we feel about this now that we understand what the parameters are and how it operates and where the uh, frictions are and where the opportunities lie and the like. So what you see before you is, is an exercise in inference sort of trying to document from a whole variety of different sources um, what's happening um, in the field. Uh, and to be honest, I think there's a, there's a risk in making visible what is otherwise invisible, right? And there are parts of the system that some people would rather not see, uh, you know, and there are parts that have been hidden for a very long time. Uh, you know, all that wonderful material, for example, on the tax uh, incentives and the tax expenditures, right, which normally is not understood as a part of policy and seen as part of the policy envelope. Um, uh, but I think at the end of the day, we believe that transparency is the road to development of better policy. And that's certainly true, I think, in the, um, in the, uh, the conversations that are beginning to happen around the United States. Anthony Radich, who's with us today in October, hosted a, um, a session in, um, uh, in Denver. Chris Tucker and I were able to go, which was about the future of um, uh, state arts agencies. And uh, what came up there was a, was a very strong discussion about how are state arts councils delivering public value, right? And that's obviously a conversation that's closely tied to the question of public policy. What is the policy? How is it in the public interest? Um, so it gave me, uh, it really encouraged me about the conversations that might begin out of today because of, of, of that. All right, a couple of the things I want to say before we turn to our first panel. Why Washington? All right, we said a little bit about that in the, uh, in the introduction to the report, but we were a little disingenuous there. I think it, it, at the bottom line, the answer to the question why Washington is also Anthony Radich. Right? As Anthony, who heads the Western States Arts Federation, said, I think that Washington and the folks in Washington might be interested in doing this. I think they might be interested in talking to you. And so Chris agreed in November of 2001 to host a meeting in Olympia uh, representatives of 10 or 12 state agencies came to that meeting, and David Carricker and I came out um, and said, um, you don't know that you need one of these, but we're going to offer one to you anyway. What do you think? And uh, that group of people was very tough with us. You know, what is it? What is your agenda? What are you thinking about? What do you mean when you're talking about cultural policy? Um, and uh, it was Dave Nicandri who said, if I understand correctly, what you're trying to be is holistic. You're really trying to understand all the pieces of the system. And he started pushing us that day to broaden 
and broaden and broaden our purview until we ended up with that list of some 60 state agencies and programs that you see um, in the report. Um, the other thing that was interesting about that day uh, is that that was the first time that that group of 12 people had been in the same room together. And that in and of itself, I think, is, uh, is significant. Um, the structure of the report, let me just say a word about that. The structure of the report is quite intentional. And you'll see that the findings, if you will, are up front rather than in the normal place at the end. Um, because we want to emphasize that they're sort of the broad, overarching stories that we see in, in what we found out in the field which is a little bit different from details about the operations of each individual agency, which are uh, reserved to the, uh, to the later chapters. Um, and as we amassed this material and began to figure out what should the table of contents look like, we had to deal with organizing the material. And that was at the point at which we said arts policy, heritage policy, uh, humanities policy. Not to reify those three, I know there's a danger of that if you arrange it in that way in the report, but because we had to have some way to organize the material. Uh, so we recognize that the boundaries between those chapters are somewhat arbitrary and, and, and a device in order to communicate a little bit. But what is even more interesting, of course, is I think is the chapters on the land-based agencies and on the, the Native American tribes and the important roles that both sets of entities play in Washington State, something which, quite frankly, was a surprise to us, although maybe so imbued in, in operations within the state of Washington that, uh, that thinking about it that way comes naturally. Um, but that has certainly been of major interest to Pew and other agencies of that sort and institutions who have seen uh, copies of this report. One last thing, and then I'll introduce the, the first panel. Um, we are very conscious that we are observing the state of Washington at one point in time. No, and some time has passed since we were in the field. Things have changed. Uh, a lot of activities have begun. Um, I'd like to think that some activities have actually begun because of the sort of perturbation that we put into the system by starting to get people together, by telling person A about person B that they had never known about before, and uh, starting to put some of those in, in touch with one another. And we are only observing one place, not multiple places. And I, I think the members of our team firmly believe that the value of this report would only become greater if we were able to look at other states with different ways of organizing the structure in order to make that kind uh, of comparison. But it's a very labor-intensive and costly process, uh, so we're not able to do many at the same time, but it is our hope that we'll be able to continue to, to develop that kind of comparative base to look at state cultural policy uh, more broadly. Uh, so those are a few uh, context-setting remarks. And let me invite up the members of the first panel, and we'll, and we'll move right to it. Uh, first of all, the, the members of our team, David Carricker, uh, who was introduced before, uh, research associate formerly of the Muskie School at the University of Southern Maine, Colleen Grogan, who is in the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago, and uh, we selected a couple of folks from among those whom we interviewed to help get the conversation started after short presentations, and Colleen Jolie, who's the tribal liaison in uh, the State Department of Transportation, and Mary Thompson, it says here, President of the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation, but there's a long list of these agencies that you've had one or another relationship with. Um, and I turn it over to David, I guess. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Again, I'm David Carricker from the Muskie School of the University of Southern Maine. Um, I'd like to thank all the people that I, who are in the room that I spoke with during the two years or so that I was involved with the study. Um, the level of hospitality and cordiality that I experienced in my travels to attend two sort of rounds of field research uh, were really quite stunning and remarkable, and I'm grateful to all of you for that. Uh, who makes cultural policy in the state of Washington? Um, in five minutes, I'm supposed to tell you the answer to that one. Um, I can't do that. Um, okay. Can you all hear me now? Okay. Um, answering that question means casting a net that captures a great many more actors than the officially anointed cultural agencies publicly understood uh, and publicly reputed to be involved in arts and, cult and culture, that is, the usual suspects. There are a lot more players than the usual suspects in the game that we have attempted to describe here. This being said, though, we still proceeded with our study on the notion that it's possible to consider the cultural policy world in ways that we could aggregate it, that is, that there's a way to conceptualize in a holistic sort of fashion, as Mark mentioned, um, the entire array of cultural players. Um, 
Making policy is also not necessarily the same as distributing money. We entered this, this study thinking, thinking and reminding ourselves of, although that's frequently a significant instrument of policy implementation. For example, the historical societies in Washington make policy every morning they open the doors to their museums to the general public. So that's simply one example of the various ways this actually takes place. Um, we also embarked on the study in presuming that a good deal of cultural policy is implicit rather than explicit. explicit. That is, it's embedded in day-to-day -day decisions and actions absent official document expressions, mandates, statutes, and other expressions of policy intention. So a lot of it is sort of off the screen, and our effort was to try to bring it to the surface. <clears throat> the number of actors um, actually engaged in all this turned out to be much larger, I think, than we ever imagined, and we kept enlarging the field as we went. And people would, one person would tell us about someone else, and so we would go talk to that someone else. You can see how we finally defined the roster of state-level policy players by looking at page 23 of the report, and there's a sort of list, a bureaucratic list, if you will, of the various actors who we identified as being major players in the game. Um, we may have missed some. Some are the usual suspects, such as the Washington State Arts Commission. Some are sovereign nations, something we haven't really thought, thought about, I think, very much about until we got out here. That's the 25 Native, Native American tribes, many of whom are engaged in historic preservation work on a very rigorous and determined basis. Um, some are like the Humanities, like Humanities Washington, formerly the Washington Commission on the Humanities. They aren't state agencies at all. That's a 501c3 nonprofit organization, but is nevertheless a significant policy player. Um, the two historical, his, the historical societies are trustee organizations, something we sort of stumbled into when we got out here. Um, they're hybrids. The, they embody elements of both a state agency and a nonprofit organization to, I think, it would be fair to say, to their benefit. So who makes cultural policy and how do they do it? Policy is made by the legislature, the governor's office, by the nonprofit organizations, such as the as Humanities Washington, but certainly not limited to them, by um, a number of taxing mechanisms that occur in no particular administrative location at all. Uh, by the federal government. The federal government has triggered a lot of cultural activity on the part of the state through financial incentives, mandates, rules, and the whole array. Um, by a welter of program offices and state departments, some of which have nothing officially to do with arts and culture at all. Again, by the sovereign nations, by the Indian tribes, by independent public commissions, the Arts Commission being a sp specific example of that kind of an entity. A policy gets made and implemented in a vast variety of, variety of ways. If you look at page 26 of the report, you'll see a, a, the graphics are intended to illuminate. Sometimes they tend to obscure. I'm not sure which this particular graphic does. But it's an attempt to graphically depict the interactions between the major, major policy players uh, in the state of Washington. Um, and it looks right. Does? <laughs> well, it's hard to, it's hard to, right on the nose. It, it's, it's sort of, um, it's hard to take, f take issue with something as diffuse as that, I think. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, what we're trying to do here is, is indicate both the interactions between those who make policy and those who's, who are the, its target, those it intends to influence. The graphic draws a distinction between policy directions, directives, that is mandates, rules, statutes, uh, technical assistance activities, and so forth that are official. Um, those are the tools of policy. And then policy conversations, which are the flow of information between the players, um, as well as reciprocal discussions occurring between them. And I think it would be fair to say that we are hopeful that, as a function of this work, that there will be more reciprocal conversations of that sort um, taking place. So that's why I'm going to stop right here with simply that and ask Colleen Grogan, my colleague here, to talk to, me, to, talk to you about focus specifically on some of the work we did with respect to illuminating activity with, as regards the land-based agencies and the Native American tribes. Colleen. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, well, I will keep my comments very brief um, because we really wanted um, to hear more from all of you rather than to listen to ourselves talk. Um, I just wanted to highlight, uh, I guess, f make four main points um, that came out of um, the two chapters, um, 
Uh, we were referring to them as land-based agencies, but um, Colleen Jolly uh, just asked me beforehand, and what do you mean by land-based agencies? Um, and uh, she, she sort of, I sort of listed them, and she said, well, you know, we usually say natural resource management um, is, I think, what's more commonly used. So, um, so I will try to change my language um, starting now. Um, so I guess what was surprising to us when you asked the question, who is making cultural policy at the, in the state of Washington, um, Again, it was surprising to us um, the, the level to which um, thinking about um, cultural resources, the environment, um, land, cultural landscapes, um, seemed to be loomed so large in the consciousness of Washingtonians. And, um, and, um, and of course, we know that there's a lot of environmentalists in the state of Washington and in the Seattle area. I um, mean, you hear about it on the news. But the fact that it was sort of infused in this notion of cultural policy was interesting to us. Um, and that there were so many activities in these um, natural resource management agencies um, was, was, again, very interesting um, and enlightening to us. Um, so, for example, the salmon recovery program um, happening in Parks and Recreation and in a number of other agencies, um, I think all the natural resource management agencies are involved in salmon recovery, um, is not just about conservation um, in a pure kind of environmentalist way, but also salmon becomes a cultural resource. Um, and a number of agencies were going in that direction of thinking about it more culturally. And that was, um, that was interesting to us. Um, and seemed worth highlighting. Um, I guess a, a key issue that I just wanted to highlight, um, and then perhaps um, Colleen and Mary could talk more about it, and hopefully the, um, you all will be interested, to, uh, will, will want to join in, um, is, is that the key struggle then in thinking about this notion of cultural policy is the balance between um, conservation and economic opportunity and um, preservation and development. And that, that really, looms large and kind of trying to figure out what is that crucial balance um, and that it really influences cultural policy in a quite different way than how we tr traditionally think about cultural policy in the arts, um, that maybe there isn't as much of a sort of key struggle uh, between economic opportunity and traditional arts policy as you see in um, uh, cultural resource policy. Uh, um, that's one observation. I'd be curious to get your thoughts. Um, the other really, um, I think, important finding um, is just the, the really important influence of Native American tribes um, in cultural policy in Washington state. Um, again, our observation was that this seems largely due to the Centennial Accord, uh, which it's my understanding is quite unusual at the state level to have this Centennial Accord. Um, and, um, and yet, uh, so lots of progress has been made in kind of thinking about the role of Native American tribes in state policy making and in this realm of resource, uh, cultural resource policy. Um, but uh, I think, again, a key issue here is, um, is the struggle between two very different conceptions of what cultural resource policy might mean. That is, I think the Native American tribes have a much more holistic view of cultural policy than perhaps Washingtonians, although cultural resource policy, as I just said, is so important to Washingtonians. But, but different, different conceptions here, I think, and that seems to be a key issue um, in, for, for the state, I would think. Um, but again, would love to hear more from all of you. Um, one last point, um, or just, a, I guess, a observation that I'd like to raise is one of our storylines um, that again was uh, of interest to us um, is that the influence in general of race and ethnicity, um, there wasn't, as far as we could, we observed, there was not a huge influence of race and ethnicity on cultural policy in the state of Washington. Um, and yet Native American tribes have a very large influence. So in some ways that storyline is not completely correct um, if you're thinking about race and ethnicity. And yet it's, it's sort of an interesting juxtaposition there. Um, but we might also, the others might disagree, you know, with that storyline in the first place. So I'll kind of raise those points and issues and then um, I'd like to turn it over to Mary and Colleen. I don't know which one of you want to go first. Do you want our press on? No. Go ahead, Colleen. Um, we, maybe we could begin by putting a question to you, which is um, what, we're, what we have, I think, collectively, or the two of us have described as a, in, a, in broad outline is an environment with an enormously diffuse array of players. Um, the, the, I guess the question that occurs to me is, 
what are the what what to what extent is that diffuse arrangement uh, a factor in the way policy gets made, the way policy gets implemented, and the way it's experienced on the part of the organizations and individuals and consortia who are its intended targets? Do you want me to go? Go ahead. Let me just leap out into foreign waters here. Uh, my name is Colleen Jolly. I'm a descendant of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa from North Dakota, but I was born and raised primarily here in Washington State. I am definitely a citizen of this area. Um, that that m map that you have of who's making policy is, is kind of a nice little map of my life as I've jumped from different um, interests and roles and functions and agencies, and so I. I think it would be a, a kind of a good idea to let you know that um, I've been here in Washington State and uh, was a social activist here in occupations of various landmarks, Fort Lawton, for instance, and Alcatraz uh, down in San Francisco and so on. So that kind of set the stage for some of my work and interests in, in um, resolving some of what could be called a cultural clash in our history of, 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 of varieties of cultures coming together. And um, I settled in Olympia about 30 years ago and went through Evergreen State College in the Native American Studies program. Um, there have been a couple of times in my life when I bumped into a few um, obstacles um, in my career path and I wanted to study art. I wanted to become an artist and um, was advised by my art teacher in a regular college that uh, my desire to carve and, and uh, be a carver in making masks and so on, a native traditional type of carving, was not real art. And my response to that was to bring together a statewide art show that was living and contemporary and traditional and cultural and that was to, well, yeah, kind of, kind of a, a response. And then I went to Evergreen State College and we um, worked hard. It took us 15 years, but we finally were able to um, build a longhouse education and cultural center at Evergreen State College. It was my master's thesis that sort of turned the, the tide there that made it possible to get that structure built on the campus to show another face to the campus of, of diversity and to provide a place of hospitality and cross-cultural exchange and education. And then um, when that was built and opened, we, the first event we had about two or three weeks after, after the grand opening of that fabulous facility was uh, the gathering of Native American artists, and that was with the support of the Washington State Arts Commission and the State Capitol Museum, where I'd done my internship, you know, 20 some years previous. So um, that then brought me deeply into working with uh, uh, traditional culture bearers of the state, the elders, if you will, the, the especially the women uh, um, basket weavers, and I worked in that group for uh, about five years in doing a lot of program development. We, we brought the group together. It went from zero to 500 members in about five, five years. And uh, they are now celebrating their 10th anniversary yeah, back in Olympia, but not at the Longhouse this time. This time they're going to celebrate it at the Squaxin Island Hotel and Casino, which was just barely getting started when we had our first gathering. And so the, it has really um, invested itself into the uh, Native community across not just Washington State, but Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and uh, Canada. And it was um, mainly through the support of the National Endowment for the Arts that 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 organization got a footing and, and really took hold. It was an investment, in fact, by the Pew Charitable Trust for uh, conferences and gatherings was part of our, our beginnings. 
And so that has survived and has really taken a deep root in the, in the Native community and ownership by the, by the tribal weavers themselves. And so it was, it was a wonderful um, ev um, kind of work to be involved in. And then uh, somehow I ended up working with George Sharp and tourism and the Office of Trade and Economic Development because I believe economic development has been a result, uh, a, a need in tribal communities uh, because of the poverty. And the poverty is there because of the cultural clash and the history and the, you know, our abysmal history in this country of, of, um, of destruction of, of tribal culture and, and communities. And so um, I've brought the, the need for economic development into every job I have done. And so here I am now at the Department of Transportation and still being somewhat of a social activist, but now <laughs> I'm in the secretary's office and people have to listen to me. <laughs> so it's, it's very nice to be in there and to have the support that I do of the administration within the agency. Times have certainly changed over the last 30 years. I'm very happy to report and we are doing a, a, a lot of uh, changing the organization at every, at every level, once again, that drawing on page 26 kind of takes a look at how our um, Centennial Accord plan is, is changing that organization. And that I, I distributed copies of our Centennial Accord plan. It's that spiral bound book that's on your tables. There's a couple of extra copies here and some CDs and you can go online and see it also on our tribal website at uh, WASHDOT. But that's something that we developed um, based in the Centennial Accord that was that uh, was achieved between the governor Booth Gardner in 1989 and the, what was uh, I think 24 tribes at the time. Since then, several more have been recognized. There are now 29 recognized federally recognized Indian tribes in Washington state. And we also work with the tribes who are recognized or outside of Washington state because we are traversing many of their usual and accustomed areas and, and disturbing, um, as a last resort, disturbing sites that are uh, of archeological and historic interest or they may be a traditional cultural property or a spiritual site, um, but, or, or you, you see what I'm saying? Those kind of areas that tribes have a very strong interest in, even though they are not there, perhaps living there. The, they might be removed on a reservation, for instance, at the Umatilla Reservation, which is in Oregon, but they have traditional areas in Washington State. When we're we're working in those traditional areas, we consult with those tribes through the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 106 of that act. We do uh, consultations, so. That's just to give you a kind of an overview of the complexity of the work that we're doing and where, where uh, we deal with the tribes, not just in this agency, but every agency in the state is supposed to have a Centennial Accord plan. We have tribal liaisons. In our agency, we actually have a tribal coordinator. In, in addition to my tribal liaison office, we have people across the, the state whose job it is, in addition to their regular job, is to be the contact person for tribes locally and, and personally, individually, so that they can work uh, close together and develop those good working relationships. So um, that's been kind of the result of our applying that Centennial Accord to our particular agency. And I'll answer questions for you, but I want to hand this over. Now I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. I think um, uh, DOT is very fortunate to have somebody with your eloquence <laughs> and, and background there. Uh, and I'm very pleased that you're there as well. Um, well, I do believe that where you sit is where you stand. And um, in order to understand my perspective, you have to understand where I come from. And I come from Olympia. So I'm a Beltway person. Uh, I, I think you will get a different perspective on, on cultural policy from people in Seattle than you will from people who are involved with the state. Uh, but on this issue of um, 
the diffusiveness, if you will, of um, policy making, cultural policy making in Washington, uh, I have to say that it was a little alarming to me that I looked at that chart on page 26 and I actually understood it. And I thought, oh Mary, you have been here way too long. <laughs> this is not a good sign. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, see you after class. Yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe it's time to get out. <laughs> but at any rate, um, I, I, um, I, I firmly believe that the fact that um, there are so many diffuse areas involved in cultural policy making in Washington is clearly our strength. Um, and I believe I can track where that whole notion that cultural policy is larger than just sort of the traditional ways we always have thought about it, I think I can track that putt back to the centennial. Um, where people from around the state came together in various different kinds of committees and started talking about sort of bigger pictures um, and started talking about culture in terms of, their, of its effect on communities, not just its effect on artists or on performers or on sort of individuals. I think to be thinking about cultural policy and its effect on communities is a very different way of, of, of thinking about it. And whether that's a physical community or whether that's a community as in tribes or in a, a variety of other things. So I think that that's, uh, that that's very important. And I think over the past 10 years then, we've seen that just sort of evolve more and more such that now as we look at another sort of seminal event coming up, the Lewis and Clark celebration, it, is, it just seems natural that in addition to the arts and historic preservation and the history museums, we're also including the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Transportation in those discussions. And I think we have evolved to the point where that wasn't something that we had to think about too much. It was a natural kind of thing. That of course, they're going to be involved in the interpretation of this kind of commemoration. Uh, and so I think that that's an example of how, you know, how we've grown um, over the past few years. I do think, you know, to, to kind of lapse into some being a little esoteric, if you will, that Washington is still involved in this um, sort of very dynamic um, soul searching, um, uh, th 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 this clash between our past as a resource exploiting kind of society, um, tribes not included in that, but a, uh, you know, that was our, 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 our European history is one of, of exploiting resources timber, fish, mining, what have you, and this sort of new history of conservation and sort of, you know, technology and all of that. And I don't think we've kind of bridged that gap yet. I think we still have this hangover of um, what we were versus what we are becoming. And, uh, you know, I don't think we're through the process of sort of change of uh, thinking through how our changing economy has changed us as people and has changed us as communities. And therefore, I think that sometimes culture um, becomes, on the one hand, it can be something that brings communities together and bring us, uh, and, and help to bring those conversations and that sort of uh, process together. But on the other hand, I think culture is looked at as, whose culture? You know, um, uh, who, whose culture are we talking about? Uh, because there is much to celebrate, even though we were a state that exploited our natural resources, that was our culture, and there's still much to celebrate there in the timber industry and the fishing industry and all of it brought, that it brought here. And I don't think that we've kind of made those connections yet. And in fact, I think and oftentimes we are almost embarrassed by our past uh, in that regard, and we haven't kind, quite come to resolution. Okay, I'll shut up <laughs> before I get myself into, into, into more trouble, but just some initial thoughts. <laughs> We'd like, to, yeah. we'd like to invite the rest of you to join into this discussion at this point. Um, I, I, let me just comment on the last thing you just said. What, I spent a lot of time interviewing, uh, I guess, people, what we would call in the in policy research world, uh, the tar policy targets in the heritage realm, historical museums and so forth. And what struck me, living in Maine, um, a state with sort of a longer gene uh, chronology uh, as a state than, than the state of Washington, how fascinated um, Washingtonians seem to be with their own past. And I joked with somebody at one of the historical museums, um, your history began here yesterday afternoon as it affects the European, in arrival of Europeans anyway. Um, 
how do, but yet there seems to be an, an incredible degree of support for, generally, heritage activities as, uh, in, more explicitly as relates to the arts. Does that strike you the same way, or am I misinformed? Or? Oh, I, I, you know, I think there, um, there's great support in some areas. I think people are very interested in, in uh, sort of where they came from. Um, and you know their their own um, sort of family and perhaps ethnic group affiliation and where they came from and what that the imprint of of, of those groups was on 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 this state. I wish I could get people to translate that into being able to uh, value their their resources, their community resources, and I can't do it. I don't know how many times I've been to communities. I, I started the state's Main Street program in 1984, and I probably have been in 75 small towns in this state. And I can't tell you the number of times I would go and talk to them about downtown revitalization or historic preservation, and the response I would get was, oh, well, we're not too interested in that. We're not even 100 years old yet. And I would, you know, I'd pound on the table and say, you know, your history is your history. And it's as good as anybody else's. Don't let anybody tell you that your history, just because it's not 300 years old, doesn't have any value. But that's a real hard message I have found to get across to people, that somehow there is this idea that unless um, you're at least 100 years old and you've got the grand house on the hill, um, then your history is worthless. Uh, as it's embodied in terms of, of physical resources. I, I, I'm sure you have a very different perspective. I, I, I want to make a comment on, on that. Um, uh, an experience that I've had, I, I totally agree with you, and um, uh, an experience that uh, a lot of us have in the Indian communities is that people who are non-Indian want to borrow or uh, pretend or become or copy um, Indian cultural identities or history uh, because they feel like they don't have or their own isn't, isn't there or real or genuine or valuable and the thing that we keep saying over and over again, you, you have a history and it's whatever it is is what it is and it's probably part of all of ours and so, you know, let's, let's stop trying to pretend to be somebody else but just be your own self and celebrate that and I, I, um, I understand what it is you're talking about and uh, there are there's another point that I understood while you were talking was is the difficulty that tribes have of, of getting some of that same kind of support that you're out there trying to get the other little towns and, and communities perhaps or, or areas of larger urban centers to understand their own history that a lot of the tribes absolutely value their own history but have a hard time accessing the resources to to preserve and maintain that uh, those histories I know the uh, Chief Joseph band that where Chief Joseph um, spent his last days in the Spielum, Washington, are trying to build a, a museum to recognize his life and history there and um, are going, they're getting started trying to find support for that, but all along the uh, Chief Joseph Trail, which is owned by the National Park Service, uh, there's, it's, there's places all over the West where Chief Joseph went on the trail, but where he, the end of his trail, has never received any kind of support because it's on the Colville Indian Reservation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, guess, I guess I'd like to say at least a little bit more optimistic about it. I know Mary does pound on the table and she does, does it very well whether she's using her shoe or just her fist. <laughs> There's a small town in Snowbird that I think can be cited that do drive their historic resources and it's where they've been able to take that resource and leave it in the economic construct that is their community. I think you can cite North Van and Wayne Jr. would like to talk a little bit about the success that's occurred there. I think Walla Walla certainly values the historic fabric in its town and it's utilized it as a means of, uh, um, thank you very much, used it as a means to um, uh, stimulate some of the economic developments there, certainly in the wine industry. I think you can look at other larger communities where there's a little bit more difficulty in terms of the political construct, say Bellingham, which has wonderful resources, but has never really been able to sort of move that forward as a civic, pro civic process. So in that sense, I think that the work that you did with the Main Street program, 
takes a generation or so to really bring into being. And I think that that time element also has to be factored into. When you ask the question, how quickly can we implement policy? Well, some things we can implement pretty quickly, but other things take a couple of generations. Jack, I don't have that much time. <laughs> I, well, you know, I guess what I get frustrated with, and, and it, so the question of this panel, where does policy come from? Policy for me comes from leadership. Um, and I, I, I think that, although we're getting there, and I'm, I'm talking not just about historic preservation, but about culture writ large, we have to do a better job, I think, of finding the right leaders in order to carry our message because it's a great message and it's getting across, I think, in certain places, but it's not getting across in some places that needs to. And I'm talking about the governor's mansion and the state legislature and our congressional delegation. Um, and although we get dribs and drabs of support from all of those entities, collectively, we have a much stronger voice and a much more compelling story to tell. And we need to start telling it and start telling it to the right people who can help us make, make things happen. So, sorry. Yes. I, if I may, I just, uh, a question that comes from one thing that David said earlier that didn't get picked up uh, yet in the conversation. One of the things that fascinated us was that the lead agencies here each had a different structure. Right? One was an independent state agency, one was an office within a bigger agency, another was a private 501c3, another was a hybrid state agency and 501c3. And uh, for those of you who had a chance to read it, or if you do have a chance to read the report, you see we, we hypothesize a lot about what difference that makes. And I wonder, uh, Colleen and Mary, what difference you think the structure of the policy agency makes in, in the sort of policies that might be proposed and pursued? Whether you have some, uh, I, I know you may be thinking about it for the first time, so I apologize, but I'd like to go in that direction a bit. Colleen? Okay. Uh, whether it's a state agency, or, um, I'll take that to begin with, and it's uh, tax supported. And if there are belief systems that, for instance, Indian communities, Indian people are not paying taxes, and the policies that are made very definitely affect the resources as they're distributed or the programs that are developed on their behalf. Um, I know it's very difficult that the, for tribal communities to uh, get support from uh, state legislature. There is the Governor's Office of Indian Affairs, which is a tiny organization um, with, uh, I think, two FTEs, and it's just been cut, that cut back by 50% of their staffing just in the last year. Um, so it, it's hard for um, tribes with 29 different sovereign nations um, to affect policy making and program development at this legislative um, level or the governor's level because th there are 29 different voices and, uh, um, and issues or communities being represented. So that in itself is very, very difficult to mesh those interests and needs. Um, let me just ask you before you, uh, you stop. Is it do you, is it more advantageous to you in the pursuit of your own uh, objectives here or not to be located administratively in the Department of Transportation? Or would there be a more advantageous location administratively for you in terms of achieving your aims? I, Are you in a good place administratively by being in, in the Department of Transportation? Is that the, the oh, right I place am. for you? <laughs> I like being there, uh -huh. uh, and, I, and uh, what happened was we, we got a new secretary about two years ago, and he has completely restructured the organization and moved the um, tribal liaison office from a sort of a half-time assignment for an existing position that was in the planning office to provide direct technical assistance to the tribes which was uh, just abysmally uh, inadequate to, to meet the needs of tribal communities. Um, uh, so he moved that position and created this in the, in the government relations office, advanced it to the point of government to government relations and recognized the sovereignty and the reality that tribes are are uh, sovereign nations and government entities. And so now 
um, although it, it's, it's me in that office, I work with everybody across the agency and across the state and have direct access to all of the, the tribes that I deal with. I have a lot of autonomy in there and uh, a lot of the support from the secretary, administrative support. And I work with the feds too. Uh, Carol, I wanted to answer your question. I think the structure has a profound effect on, on cultural policy. Um, uh, how you're structured as an agency then um, it, it governs how policy initiatives are developed and pursued. It, um, it, it, you know, it differs in, in, in terms of um, what kinds of constituencies are there to support you. Where can you go for you know, that all important sort of um, uh, you know, a personal support for, for your initiatives, um, how you go about getting budget allocations. I mean, it just influences everything. I, I think structure cannot be overlooked as, as, a, as a principal way of, of policy making. Um, you know, I, I have always believed that, I heard a long time ago the phrase that policy is what really happens. It's the thing that, you know, what, what really happens on the ground. Yeah, um, you, can, you can have the most wonderful written policy, but um, it, what, gets, what actually gets funded, what actually gets happen, what happens is your policy, whether, you, whether it says it or not. And the most important policy document, therefore, is the budget, because that tells you what you value as, a, as, a, as an organization or as a state or as a municipality. So your policy, I, I think you alluded to it um, a, a little earlier, David, I mean, I, I think it's all right there. Back, 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 back. Gentlemen back there. It's my observation that for years in the state, policy has been a reactive process on the part of state agencies and local agencies, and that a lot of the initiative has really come from the private sector uh, to push public agencies into policy positions through various mechanisms. And I'm wondering how the panel and also the people that developed the report and others that are in this room feel that is now playing out and whether we're starting to see a shift of that with public agencies starting to take more of a leadership role um, in partnership with but, but leading the private sector, which to me would, is a reversal. I'm starting to sh see a shift over how the state has operated cultural policy development over the last several decades. And I'm curious if others saw that and if you saw that in development of the report. <laughs> well, um, Gee, Donovan, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, it has in, in the past come from the private sector, mostly because private sector provides cover <laughs> for a lot of the uh, cultural agencies that, that probably needed it. Um, maybe it is shifting. I don't know that I've observed that um, as much, but I do think that it, I do think the power of personality is very important. Again, the, sort of that whole question of leadership. And if you have a powerful personality in any of these agencies, um, I, I, I've learned long ago that the, the ability to build relationships, the ability to uh, be heard, the ability to collaborate does propel you into a position where you can probably influence change. And I can see that there are probably, there are some, some of those folks out there. I mean, I, I see Chris Tucker out here and I think she's a perfect example of someone who has, you know, kind of come in and transformed the arts, um, the arts commission and through her own personal integrity and her own personal competence has really elevated the arts in the state. So, and I think Alison Brooks is another example as well. And those, those powerful individuals, powerful personalities, I think can't be underestimated. If you could give your name and affiliation, it would be helpful because we're recording all of this. Sure enough, thank you. My name is Jeffrey Thomas and I work with the Puyallup Tribe as director of their Timber Fish and Wildlife Program, and I'm a cultural resource specialist and advisor to the Tribal Cultural Department. Uh, I really appreciate the conversation and all the updates and uh, developments that you've been able to share with the group today about cultural policy and uh, who's making it at the state level. Of course, tribes have been brought out as an important force and ingredient of cultural policy development for Washington and maybe some of the uh, dilemmas facing tribes and unifying their voices and positions and influence uh, relating to cultural policy or cultural resource management approaches uh, at the state level uh, in terms of state legislative uh, 
uh, provisions, that kind of thing, has been uh, pinpointed as uh, maybe um, uh, essentially problematic. I did want to just, uh, I have a question for you, but I uh, just wanted to make, a men make mention of a group that does seem to be uh, or, uh, providing that intertribal cultural resource advisory uh, type service. It's the Intertribal Cultural Resource Advisory Group of Washington State, and uh, they actually, they write this year are really going to emphasize to tribal governments that are involved in natural resource uh, or discussions the significance or the need, the need and significance of funding tribal programs for baseline cultural resource management. So uh, it's not just natural resource management, it's a standalone type of management need, it's cultural resource management, and right now tribes don't have baseline funding. You know, if you think about it, everybody that's then depending on that tribal input back to them regarding the, uh, the, um, the um, presence or significance of cultural resources in a project area uh, uh, is probably suffering uh, because of the um, uh, lack of uh, uh, genuine input from the local tribe. So they make conclusions there's nothing there, that there's no impact. In fact, those are probably fallacious because you don't have a tribal program that, in fact, has uh, been put in a position where it could really stand behind that, um, that conclusion. So tribal funding is a big thing, and anything that can happen for it here in Washington State to establish a baseline program, put the, probably put them in a much better position to work with all of the other stakeholders, uh, maybe uh, in, in ways that they might jointly address cultural resources. Uh, maybe. Um, Rem or symbol or, uh, or, uh, exemplified by the uh, recent product here in Washington State, the Cultural Resource Protection and Management Plan that's now uh, recognized by the State Department of Natural Resources and the plan that more or less prevails when it comes to addressing tribal and even non-tribal concerns on non-federal forest lands in Washington State. That's all private and timber. You know, in this methodology, you do find a cultural resource assessment methodology that's watershed oriented. So it's not as if we don't have, haven't put some thought into what are we looking for for cultural resources on a watershed or larger scale when it comes to tribal governments. And there's also a non-tribal section in there that the state office helped develop. But I, I, uh, my question is, is there a way that the state agency oriented CRPMP approaches and commitments might serve as a model for accommodating uh, future tribal, non-tribal cultural resource needs. So right now we have a way that at least one stage, state agency and actually Fish and Wildlife, those re relating to the timber industry, uh, recognize as an approach for tribes and, uh, and uh, um, a, uh, local landowners to work together uh, towards uh, addressing cultural resource management needs, especially in a voluntary uh, using a, a, on a voluntary basis, not just rule-based, not just pro prioritized program-based, or uh, but actually uh, picks up the, the, the things that those don't pick up and talks about how you might do voluntary work for them. But is that something that these state agencies should be working towards? So should we be all rallying around this as a model, taking it to the legislature, saying, hey, this, there's a group that's already trying to cover this ground, uh, put us a little further ahead than we really think we might be or might even be recognized in a study such as this, uh, just to kind of launch us forward and, and get us off the ground? And if there is, um, how might the university help facilitate that? Uh, well, I, I don't know about the university, but I'm excited about that. I tell you, that will make our world a lot easier to live in. And I, I'd like to uh, take this, this one minute here to, to, to um, talk about the obvious of, of uh, when tribal interests are, are addressed in cultural resources, um, we think of who we are and connected completely to our environment and history and belief systems. It's not something that is separate, like here's the opera, here's the theater, here's our literature group, here's our universities. Here, you know, the, the, uh, when you think of culture and the, the high arts, for instance, that, that, that kind of way that is bundled and packaged in, in another way of thinking of culture. And so I, I just wanted to make that note that, that suddenly we can get into fisheries and treaties and, and public policy in that capacity and economic development and so on and so forth, and cultural preservation. And, but um, uh, I, I just wanted to make that clear here of, of the difference. And I'm so happy to be able to have the tribal um, 
culture represented in this conversation at all. I mean, it's just fabulous. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say something about that. Jeffrey, um, for those of you who don't know, is almost personally, almost completely personally responsible for this document. And his years and years of pounding on the table and work have finally, I think, come to some fruition in a, in a remarkable document that um, for not only defines culture as, uh, and cultural resources as the things we traditionally think about, archaeological sites, burials, um, historic sites, but also expands that definition to things like plants and animals and places. Pla and, and I think that, that that's extraordinary you know, to be able to kind of capture that in, 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 in a document and a process. And I think also what is uh, fascinating about this particular document is the, is the amount of faith it has in the, um, uh, in the basic goodness of the average person to want to be a good steward of the land. And as I think the report has so accurately reflected, I think if there's anything that draws us together as a, as a state, it's the interest in being good stewards of the land, whether that's from an environmental approach or a cultural approach. And if there's any unifying concept for us, I think that's it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Chris Tucker. I'm the director of the State Arts Commission, and I'll have to admit to a certain naive optimism two years ago when this landed um, in our office, and uh, um, really great pleasure and continued curiosity about the document that we have before us, so thanks again to the team for coming to Washington State. Um, I know that there are several in the room who are saying, gosh, I wouldn't have said it that way. And I think that's part of the richness of this discussion. Uh, one of the real learnings in this book actually is that, gosh, I wouldn't have said it that way. In other words, we continue to see culture and cultural policy in so many ways, that diversity and um, really diffusion, I think is a real strength in this state it's also a huge challenge in this state. And when we look at stewardship, Mary, you said um, stewardship of the land. I would say stewardship of our culture is even broader, that that is really part of our role with this document, is the stewardship role that we have right now, sort of like passing the baton or passing the microphone. It's our turn now, and what are we going to do with that? Um, so again, moving forward, I think that we have found a lot of strength in the disconnection and the diffusion of cultural policy in this state. In other words, we can make stuff happen, whether we are a state agency that's independent or part of a larger state agency or a nonprofit or a quasi nonprofit or what, all of these different definitions, but each one has its own separate culture within the larger cultural discussion. And so that takes a certain amount of our effort and energy and stewardship just to keep that ball in the air. So I think that that is a real focus for us. The challenge I'm thinking about today is the what now challenge. We have this great thing and we are able right now I think to work as really great cultural partners. This document will help us do that better. I don't see us being great partners in everything. So I am interested in some discussion today about the thing, whether it's a nugget or a huge chunk, that provides us new opportunities for moving forward a more coordinated cultural policy discussion for the next generations of leadership. Uh, the second panel in part is going, to, uh, is going to be addressing that. But I guess I would ask you, uh, to, uh, if given the diffuse nature of policy in the state and given the value that I think we have, many of us at least attached to that the, the, broad, the, broad, the broadness of the array, is that in itself a barrier to the kind of coordinated collaboration that I think we'll be talking about later? But what, what's your own take on that? Is there a mic? dominate the discussion. I'm sure it's a barrier. I mean, I, one of the things, I think there's also a theme of overwhelm in this whole document. We've just got a whole lot of stuff to do and our staff has been cut. Again, in the past two years, our budgets are cut, our staff has cut, the taxpayer expectation and the citizen expectation have become huger challenges for all of our agencies. So yes, this is, uh, this certainly is a barrier. Um, but we wouldn't be in this business if we didn't love challenges. So <laughs> now what? 
Hi, um, I'm Brad Gerlach with WSU Extension in King County. And to maybe throw a, another challenge or barrier into this, um, I think the discussion's been great about what I'm sort of thinking of are in place or existing cultures, the Native American culture, the Europeans who have come in. But my question is, is sort of people who looked at this um, came into our state and looked. Did you see any way that our sort of new culture, the large number of immigrant communities coming into Seattle in the Pacific Northwest, do they have a place at setting policy? Are they involved in setting policy? Or is there an agency that's representing them so when we see you know, the Ukrainians or our Hmong folks coming in, this is a, an opportunity for a new culture that we don't want to lose, but is there somebody who's helping them have a voice in setting policy or at least being the policy broad enough to incorporate those challenges? I don't, um, just an observation, I, I don't uh, have the answer. I, I, was, I was curious about the same thing and, and sort of touched on that briefly in my comments. Um, I guess what, what we observed, and, and we might just have missed something, um, we talked to the, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the actual, um, there's sort of, a, there's a light, each uh, African American um, commission uh, group. I'm forgetting the exact name of, of these groups. Um, there was an Asian American minority and Minority Affairs. Um, and we went and talked to each of those um, organizations to understand their own, from their own perspective, what are they doing, how, how do, what are they doing um, in terms of cultural policy for the state of Washington, how do they see um, their minority group impacting cultural policy. And uh, from the interviews, anyway, they're there just was not much happening there at all. And their primary focus um, was really on economic uh, development um, for new immigrants um, in terms of state policy. And very little, what they thought was that the, the emphasis on cultural policy for new immigrants was, um, was superficial. Um, that is, you know, somebody that I interviewed um, from uh, uh, the uh, Hispanic new immigrant populations um, in Washington state said, you know, sure, we have, we celebrate um, Mardi Gras or we celebrate, you know, some festival, uh, but that's not our real culture. And it, it did not seem to have the richness that, um, in thinking about the com communities of culture and certainly thinking about um, uh, the connection between state agencies and Native Americans. Now, what I, again, just an observation, um, the Centennial Accord, it seems to me, is just huge in the state of Washington to get in each state, the fact that each state agency has to have something in place um, due, the, due to the Centennial Accord for how it's going to deal with um, uh, Native American tribes and how it will incorporate Native American tribes in is huge. And um, something like that for new immigrant groups, um, I would think would, it would be, have an enormous influence, um, but I don't know if there's anything any, anywhere near the works. Um, so comments from other people. Um. Oh, well, my name's Laura Malone. I work with VSA Arts of Washington, a 501c3. We provide inclusive arts programming for people with disabilities throughout Washington State. And on that subject that you're bringing up, it's up to every single person in this room to make sure on every state agency there is something provided like the Centennial Accord because right now the groups that are that you spoke with, you interviewed them and they are concerned with economic um, policies because that's the number one thing, eating every day and surviving. But if everyone else who has the privilege of um, the luxury of not having to worry about those things can take up the call for the things that will support those communities in the future and support the children of those communities in the future, then it'll get done. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to provide just a, a bit of transition. Uh, uh, a couple things that were said uh, brought up a couple thoughts in my mind. And, and uh, this past week, I had the opportunity to go to a talk by Dana Joya, who's the new chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. He's been in place about a year. And uh, he said a very interesting thing uh, that afternoon. He said, the biggest mistake that the National Endowment for the Arts ever made was to come to the conclusion that it was uh, to serve artists and arts organizations 
rather than to serve the citizens of the United States. Um, and it's an interesting way of putting the public policy question in cultural policy. And, and, and I, I, I hasten to, to put the word public in the middle of that phrase, although it's a little awkward, cultural public policy. But that's what we really are talking about. Um, and it, uh, it relates, I think, to a number of things that, that were said here on this, on this panel. I would like to note that we've had now for an hour a conversation among 50 or 60 people where the phrase cultural policy has been issued, uttered many, many times, and not a single person has broken out in hives. <laughs> right? uh, it's very interesting. And uh, 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 if, if you know about the nature of this discussion at the national level, you will know that it's absolutely verboten to say cultural policy. And Carol will tell you that uh, one of the graduates of the Cultural Policy Center uh, applied for a job in Washington, and they said, you must take that off your resume. No, but the important thing it was the, <laughs> the important thing to note there, Mark, is that it was the National Endowment for the Arts. It was the National Endowment for the Arts. I to, wasn't who sure. was looking for a policy analyst, so we sent them from the Cultural Policy Center a candidate, and they said you really should take that off because we don't know what that would be. Right. <gasps> right. It's it's a very interesting question, isn't it? Um, now the, the the division between panels is very much just as arbitrary as the division between the chapters of the book, uh, and uh, I'm sure that a lot of the themes that we've already broached will come up again in conversation. Uh, we would like to give people an opportunity for a break. We'd like to make it a little shorter than the schedule calls for because the, the opportunity here is really to have conversation. So there's some coffee and other refreshments right by the door. The restrooms are, if you go out the door, turn right and then right again for the men, left for the women, and not very far. And we'd like to ask people to come back as quickly as possible so that we can begin the second panel. Please join me in thanking the first panelists.